Hello, and welcome to today's Sky High Scoop, mastering the art of investing in a great condo building. Today's episode is all about smart downtown Toronto condo acquisitions because finding the perfect nest is about more than just the square footage of your suite. We're here to help you navigate the vertical city and make wise choices that'll pay off in the long run. In this episode, we're giving you an insider's guide to essential factors you should consider when buying a condo in a condo building as an asset, rather than focusing solely on your four walls. We'll delve into everything from the status certificate and maintenance fees to elevators, concierge services, and neighborhood development. Our goal is to arm you with the information you need to invest confidently in high-rise living. So join us as we unlock the secrets of downtown Toronto's condo scene. It's week four of April 2023. We are Fox Marin Associates, Toronto's most innovative and active brokerage in central and downtown Toronto. We aren't here to regurgitate boring stats. You can find those anywhere. We are here to share what we're seeing going on in the Toronto real estate market in real time on a weekly basis so you can be in the know and make informed decisions. If you're interested in getting an up-to-the-moment opinion on what is happening in Toronto real estate right now, learning what's going down, boots on the ground before it becomes a statistic, then you're in the right place. My name's Ian Busher. I am a broker with the FM team. Keeper number handy, this is Corey Marin, our in-house hype girl and resident expert listing broker, and a good man to know, Mr. Ralph Fox, our analytical, investor-driven, macro picture watcher. We do this every week, so hit, or as Ralph likes to say, smash that subscribe button and join us for the latest updates every seven days. All righty. Now, are we ready? We're going to dive into the heart of today's episode. We know you want to ensure your purchase is more than just a pretty space. Say goodbye to tunnel vision on your four walls and hello to a well-rounded approach that will maximize your investment potential. Corey, tell us about uh, the, uh, the topic generator. What did you call it? The random generator? The random generator? Tell oh, us about that, I'm so that, excited please. about this. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know me, I do love board games and all types of games. So this is a way for us to discuss this exciting and enthralling topic in a creative and exciting, magical, mystical way. And so I have the random generator box right here. Mm -hmm. And inside this box, I have uh, a bunch of ideas from the team about mm -hmm. what makes a condo building in Toronto great. And just to be clear, we're not talking about the suite itself, the layout and the features and finishes. We're talking about when you're looking to acquire a condo, what are some things you may or may not be thinking about uh, as you make an acquisition in this type of property asset? So we have a bucket of ideas and I thought it would be fun if I put my hand into the random generator and pulled out a topic for us to discuss uh, because I know we're, it's packed full of some great material for our listeners today. Does this sound like a good idea, boys? Yes. Are you guys Absolutely. in? Absolutely. I, I feel like we need a drum roll. Oh, that'd we, be do. Great. we do. We do. Yeah, we got to work on our sound effects. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One day we'll get that advance. We'll get, yeah. Okay. It's my job for this send, week. Send the note, send the note to the producer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to pick at random a topic. I'll toss it out to one of you and then we can discuss and then move on. There's a lot of quality ideas that have come from our awesome team and I think this is going to be really beneficial for our listeners because there's a lot of things um, I think they really should be considering and if you've never lived in a condo before um, you might not know some of these things and if you've lived in a condo you learn through experience I know I certainly have through my experience living in condos so uh, we'll have lots of interesting anecdotes about some of these things too so I'm going in excellent bring it on you can hear it yeah it's generating it's generating at random <laughs> Exactly. That All wheel right. on the price is right. I'm nervous. Okay. What's it going to be? The first one was like kind of boring, so I put it back. <laughs> We're already cheating. We haven't oh. even started. Oh, okay. Here Not we go. that one. Okay. Not that. Not. Okay. All right. All right. The got? first one, just so people know there's actual context here. I'm not faking it. All right. I'm going to throw this out to Ian because Ooh. we know that canines love one. We know canines always love Ian the best as much as we want them to love us more. Um, so I'm going to toss helps out. walking around with dog treats. I know. Liver in your back pocket. Yeah. It's true. You yep. Cheat. Put a little right. bacon behind your ear before you leave the house in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the first one is considering pet rules. Absolutely. Um, on an MLS listing, uh, we have the option of putting um, pet under pet restrictions 
we get to check yes or no or restricted. And sometimes people uh, think that restricted means no. And just to be perfectly clear here, right out of the hopper, that's not the case. Um, if it says pets allowed, yes. I mean, this is something where we should check the status certificate for some clarity, mm -hmm. but are pets allowed? Yes. Are pets allowed? No. Usually the no means 100% no. Restricted, on the other hand, means yes, but with some caveats in place, with some rules around things like how many, what type. Um, mm -hmm. So when you read the rules for the building, uh, you may end up discovering that uh, it's uh, no dogs over 30 pounds is a common one. Uh, mm -hmm. No more than two pets per suite, so you can have a cat and a dog. Maybe it's a cat and a dog that isn't over 30 pounds. Another common one is no uh, domesticated pets is some of the language that's used as well. So, you know, no snake collection, no spider collection, none of that weirdness. Um, <laughs> not that that's, I mean, if that's what you're into, it's totally fine with me. But the building <laughs> might not be cool with that. So we've got the options of yes, but don't assume that it's a uh, yes, 100%. No, you can kind of assume that that's a flat out no pets at all. And restricted is get a copy of the rules, probably from the listing agent via your buying agent, and find out what those restrictions are. And if you've got two big dogs, you're going to want to check this in advance because you don't want to choose between the sweet and fluffy. I know, fluffy. Fluffy always gets screwed. Absolutely. And did I hit all the points, are, do you think? You did. Okay. And buildings are very anti-big dog, I find. They love the little dogs. And oftentimes yes. the condo rules will say you can have a pet under 30 or 40 pounds and you have to be able to carry the pet mm. um, through the common elements. And right. so our dog, who's 100 pounds, would not be permitted in most condo buildings, even though he's so lovable and gracious. And um, never barks. I know. The little dogs are the yappy ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And just because you see a dog in a building, if you're viewing the property, this is mm -hmm. what often buyers think. They're like, well, I saw a German Shepherd. They must be allowed. I'm like, no, 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 no. This, we've got to double check this. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say more often than not, there's restrictions than a free-for-all. Absolutely. That's a, yeah, that's, a really, that's a really good point, Corey. Uh, if you're in a building and you do see a big German Shepherd, you know, maybe even that German Shepherd lives there or maybe they part-time live there. But visitor. if all of a sudden you get a German Shepherd and your neighbor complains and you're not compliant with the condo corp laws and they make enough of a stink about it, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have a really bad situation on your hands and you never want to have to be in a position to even consider saying goodbye to Fluffy because at the end of the day, it <laughs> obviously would be the condo. Yes. I would choose Fluffy yeah. over the condo. Oh, like yeah. If Fluffy I, has to go, I go too. Yeah. Also, one thing to add here, too, is uh, there's a building down on Queen's Key where they didn't have a pet restriction for the first few years, and then they implemented it. But they let the people who had a big dog keep the dog because they were there as sort of a grandfathering. Grandfather, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you might see a Great Dane in the elevator, but when that Great Dane is gone, that owner can't get another one. Now, that rule is in effect for everyone after that fact and even that person going forward. So yeah. again, yeah, don't uh, don't go by your eye, go by the rule of the building. 100%. Yeah. And oftentimes that guide dogs and therapy dogs are permitted as um, an exclusive to the rules as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And, and I can't tell you, people. I can't tell you how many times we have buyers or renters, they're coming to us and they're like, I've got a big dog and I can't find a place to live. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes that's why, you know, townhouses, or lower level townhouses with direct outdoor access, even though they're condoized, uh, can hold a lot of value because they're specific to dog owners who don't, especially big dog owners being one ourselves, all three of us actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, a real, it's a real thing. And sometimes people get a big dog and they don't even think about uh, their personal li li living circumstances and mm -hmm. what kind of duress that could put them under uh, in the city. Because as we all know, big dogs are very much discriminated against. And as we discussed earlier on, unjustifiably, because it's not the size of the dog, it's the energy of a dog, and it's yep. how well the dog is trained. Absolutely. And that's all I have to say about that. Well, I think it's time for me to dip into the random generator. <laughs> oh, while, you look, while you look, I'm going to think about maybe getting a therapy snake. <laughs> Always wanted a, a little, You could get like one of the a little bib for it. 
Yeah, exactly. Service, service yeah. sneak. Service Lori, can we get yeah. a Can we get a ferret? <laughs> a service. Are cute. I yeah. know. This is a service tarantula for my service ferret. <laughs> All right, Corey. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> Ralph. Oh, boy. This is a big one. Oh, and boy. for our listeners out here, this is probably the most important one. <sighs> Maintenance fees. Oh, yeah. This is a huge, huge topic. So right off the top, the first thing that I'm going to say is, is that a lot of people get worked up about maintenance fees, uh, some justifiably and some unjustifiably. Uh, the first thing is uh, whether it's freehold or a condo where you pay maintenance fees, uh, there is no such thing as a maintenance free property. Uh, and so if you own a house, you're going to be paying for the maintenance of that house one way or another, just yes. maybe not on an amortized monthly basis, but generally in giant, holy shit chunks. So I just need to get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, is that uh, all buildings do have maintenance fees. Uh, the average in uh, Toronto right now is probably about 80 cents a square foot. Uh, anything over a dollar starts to become a little bit significant and significant in the way where it affects price. So I would look at it almost like a scale where you have low maintenance fees, high prices. And then as the maintenance fees start to creep up, the prices will be affected in the same way. And so condos do uh, tend to have a shelf life uh, and over time, the rate at which they appreciate, meaning they go up in value, starts to decrease as the buildings get older and the cost to run these buildings start to eat up into it. And that's why it's amazing, you know, someone will send a listing and they're like, oh my gosh, 1,700 square feet for only $450,000 in downtown Toronto. And you're like, yeah, the maintenance fees are 3,000 a month. So it's really important to understand the relationship between maintenance fees and value. Um, but no matter what property you're looking at, you will definitely be paying to maintain it. And then there are some buildings that are better run or better built than others. And I think you'll see that affected in, uh, in, in prices. For sure. And then in addition to that, you'll also want to find out what's included in your maintenance fees. Mm -hmm. So sometimes some buildings um, have all the utilities included which you know significantly impacts your monthlies and is awesome when they are included. And then what services are included as well and what amenities do the buildings have and are you going to use those amenities as well? So if you have a building with lots of amenities like a you know an outdoor pool and 24 hour concierge and a gym and a lot of the services, over time your maintenance fees are going to go up. Uh, so that's just something you need to consider and weigh when you're looking at maintenance fees. And a lot of people, especially when they're first looking at buildings, um, they're really drawn to a lot of the bells and whistles. And then they never use any of the amenities. Like I've lived in tons of condo buildings and I don't think I've ever used the pool once. I don't want to mm -hmm. swim with my neighbors. <laughs> I want to mm -hmm. be like, Hi, I'm in my bathing suit. And it's like my neighbor Jack is down the hall. I just feel weird. I just don't like it. So that's something else to weigh when it comes to the maintenance fees as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, and then in addition to that, when you have parking and locker, you pay a maintenance fee on your parking and locker as well. And people don't know that. It's its, it's own separate title. It's its own separate pin. Uh, that means you can sell it um, as you could any other piece of property that you own in a building or, or house. And so um, it's separately deeded, I guess, is the best way to explain it. And so that also has its own maintenance fee. So if you have a parking and locker, you're paying a fee for those two in, in your monthlies. So that's mm -hmm. something else to keep in mind. I was also going right. to throw out uh, condos, yeah. um, uh, co-ops and co-ownerships also will include the property tax. So that's mm -hmm. why those will seem a lot, a lot higher. But uh, yeah, it's, it's care you have need to be careful. Make sure that you understand what is actually included. So it might not 100%. be as bad as it seems when you subtract those First line items. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. I'm going into the generator. All right. I'm excited. I love this. Oh, this is actually good. We were okay. just talking about it. Amenities. Let's talk about oh, amenities. Perfect. Yeah. Huh. The generator is on our side today. <laughs> Corey, you were already talking about it. Do you want to keep going? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. okay. So for our listeners or viewers, amenities in a building, 
um, are used a lot to help sell the building, first of all. So when you purchase into a condo building, especially pre-construction, they'll really use the amenities to really try to draw uh, buyers and investors into the building. And these can include a wide variety of services, as mentioned, a gym, a pool. You'll see some condo buildings that have bowling alleys, uh, golf, uh, what's it called? Golf simulator. Golf simulator. Simulator. Yeah. Squash <laughs> courts. Yeah. Squash courts. You'll see, um, uh, I think I said movie theaters. You'll see mm-hmm. oh, party rooms, rooftop yeah. terraces with barbecues. Uh, pet cleaning stations, which is awesome if you have a pet, but of course the pet has to be under 40 pounds, so I don't know. Um, and then also lounge. Enough, yep. business lounge, yep. a whole bunch of stuff. And you pay for these when you live in the building. And yes, they're very attractive to uh, potential renters, investors, and end users. But then again, over time, I don't think they're used as much as people think they're going to be used. I think the best amenity out of all the amenities out there is a concierge. Yep. And I, I don't think you even know how much you will use a concierge until you live in a building. And they're awesome. They can, and especially if you live in a building with a great concierge with an awesome attitude, it's so helpful. It is like living in a hotel. Mm-hmm. So they can manage your, you know, keys, pass offs, uh, parcels. They're practically like part time, you know, post office men and women now because they're handling so many Amazon packages coming in flower deliveries, communication with relatives coming and staying. Um, they keep the building secure. They get, they'll help manage your Uber delivery for your dinner that day. Like it's really awesome. And I would say out of all the amenities, that one for me personally has always had uh, the most amount of value. And when you look now at buildings that do not have a concierge service, a lot of buyers are questioning like, well, what do I do with my packages and where do they go and how do I manage all of that? And so some buildings have a good system in place and others do not. So this is something else, buyers out there, if there is no concierge, you're going to want to find out how to manage your packages and parcels. Should they be delivered? Where do they go and how do they get to you? A mm-hmm. um, couple things I'd like to add. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite amenity in a condo is a delivery room. Yes. And you'll see so many of the condos built pre-Amazon or pre-pandemic for sure. Mm-hmm. And you walk into the lobbies and they've got like boxes stacked like all the way to the ceiling because they just weren't built with consideration of people receiving deliveries. And it's so nice when you walk into some of these newer buildings and they have an actual locked door package room. So you know your Toronto Maple Leafs pajamas are going to be tucked away safe and sound <laughs> because you got that $5 coupon on Amazon at 4 o'clock in the morning and just couldn't resist. So that's really important. Um, a lot of our investor clients or um, clients who are sensitive to maintenance fees uh, really tend to look for more bare bones because they realize that their maintenance fees are encompassing services or their accompanying uh, costs that really rarely get used. I cannot tell you how many times, uh, you know, I see people get so worked up about the party room that in three years time, they are never going to use once. Mm-hmm. The party mm-hmm. room is like the biggest, oh my God, look at this party room. We'll have all our friends. No one wants to go to a party in a condo room. I'm it telling the you this worst. right now. <laughs> nobody, nobody, mm-hmm. nobody, mm-hmm. nobody. Mm-hmm. nobody. Mm-hmm. Just, we live in a big city with a lot of bars and restaurants and all kinds of cool things. Nobody wants to see your party room. And <laughs> after you move in, you're not even going to want to see it. So get that out of your head. <laughs> and sometimes having concierges isn't all it's cracked up to be. Um, I have found myself in a former life, uh, ended up giving career counseling and life counseling to many, many a concierge, sometimes late at night, sometimes early in the morning, sometimes middle of the afternoon, thinking that a young 25-year-old Ralph has all the answers when, you know, I've got other things on my mind. So, I'm sure you uh, did. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so concierges can definitely be a little bit invasive. Uh, and sometimes it's nice if you're living in the big city just to have a bare bones condo. Um, 
where uh, all of the maintenance goes to the suite and, and keeping things uh, as inexpensive as possible. So, mm -hmm. you know, people feel a lot of different things about that, but, um, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of, and that's why you said, Corey, this is a, a hot topic because people have a lot of strong feelings on what should be included, what they want to have included. Do they want full service? Do they want to pay for full service? Or do they want the location and the, the lower operating costs? I tend yeah. to be in the latter. And viewing, th viewing the city as my amenity. Totally. It's my playground. And I get why they're attractive. I think as a buyer, you just have to consider, well, will I actually use this? Yeah. Yep. That's all you have to ask yourself. Will I actually? Like, I, don't, I hate using the condo gym, too. It's boring. No. It's really boring. Yep. And if there's only two treadmills in there, right, it doesn't take long to fill them up, and you go down expecting to do what you wanted to do, and you can't. I know. And so that they're usually pretty small. They try to keep them on the smaller side. I know. They're never as glamorous as they look in the renderings. Ever. No. <laughs> never. Okay, I'm back in the random generator. All right. This is a really good one. Good job, team, for coming up with this idea. Proximity to green space and or transit. I will, I feel like Ralph is just itching to answer this. I'm going to start with Ralph and then Ian, please jump in. Okay. I love answering my own question. Um, I, think it, I think it's really important for value and I think it's pretty important for ease of lifestyle. Um, uh, I think with the pandemic, access to green space has become just very high on people's needs and wants. And I think that when somebody's looking at a condo, they'll make sacrifices on some things knowing that they have access to green space. So, oh, I don't need a balcony or I'll just take a smaller balcony and a smaller footprint because the park is my, is my terrace. Mm -hmm. So I think people really, really have um, an appreciation for that. And uh, I think now more so than ever, and I expect that trend to continue, uh, and then transit, you know, there's a war on cars in Toronto. Um, traffic is insane. Uh, people don't want to drive. So the preferred way of, uh, uh, of getting around in the city, um, presuming you arrive alive, That's is the TTC. Say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, like, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. As long as you don't get stabbed, beaten, yeah. whatever, and you arrive there safely, um, but it is the, it is the way um, more and more people uh, are electing not to have cars just because it's just so expensive. And so um, either Uber or the TTC is the way people are getting around and the easier and more accessible uh, a property is to TTC and to transit, the greater value and the greater utility that it has. And so the other aspect to it is sometimes it doesn't even have to be existing. It can be, you know, I, I bought this condo and the relief line is coming here or the Ontario line is coming here and in five or 10 or 50 years time, there will eventually years. be a train station here or a subway station. And so the thought of, of that is very helpful. And I've seen a, a few studies that show that when you live in proximity to mass transit, the value of your property goes up significantly. So uh, from, a, from a lifestyle, from a transit standpoint, from an accessibility standpoint, uh, and from a, a value standpoint of appreciation, these are things people are going to want to live near. They say the three biggest rules of real estate are location, 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 transit, and outdoor space are a huge component to that equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100% agree. I've got a client right now who owns a condo and just wants to relocate because he's in the middle of a concrete jungle. And speaking of the pet rules, he's got a little dog and he's like, I go downstairs, there's nowhere to go. I didn't have the dog when I got here, but now I would really appreciate having the park, having the lake, having a walking path somewhere oh. close by instead of just shopping and things for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, that totally so, yeah, makes sense. Comes up all the time. The other, th the other thing to think about with transit, though I totally agree, it adds value to the property. You also have to consider noise. And I'm not talking necessarily about subway, but I'll just use my own personal example. One of my condos was on Queen's Key. Bought this condo, got it for a really good price, go to bed for my first night, and all I can hear is the streetcar going down the tracks and like the sound of it, like the doors opening and closing and that like sound, that ding, I was like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, 
This is the worst decision. And I'm not even noise sensitive at all. I can sleep through anything. And I was like, oh my God, I'll never be able to sleep ever again near this streetcar. I mean, mind you, over time you get used to it. So I think being close to transit is good. But if you're sensitive to noise or anything like that, just beware exactly when you are in proximity to, you know, the, the humming or the sound or the vibration of it all, because it's certainly a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love it. We're just speeding through. All right. All right, boys. Big money. No whammies. Oh, this is a really good one. And if you guys don't want to answer this one. Did you say no whammies? I did. I did. Yes. No, only, only a specific person from a specific elk. Oh, above a certain would age. Would understand. Yeah. That I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Relevance of that. Yeah. There you, you know go. Whammies? You just proved Ralph's point. There you Unless go. you're just trying to look young by I pretending really you don't, don't know what it is. Know. Sort of what a terrible. Is it? Terrible game show. A whammy was like, you lose your turn. Doesn't. Oh. Yeah. It's fine. I'm old. I'm proud of it. Yeah. I'm old. Yeah. Sorry. What, what do you got? I can't what even that read say? that. No, I didn't want you to. Oh. This is such a good one. Garbage shoot. Did I see that? Something about, yes. I saw a garage. Garbage shoots. Yeah. Mm. The location and the collection area. Mm-hmm. Um, Ian, do you have any experience near this? I certainly can jump in because I have had this experience too. Yes, and um, unless it's a separate thing in the random generator, that's also proximity to elevator, banks of elevators too, right? Yes. So essentially both of these are noise-making devices. So if the garbage chute happens to be right beside where your bedroom is the in the floor plan of your unit and somebody on your floor <laughs> – you know, gets up at two o'clock in the morning and decides that's when they want to throw away all their glass bottles down the recycling chute or the something. Worst. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be hearing that. So, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You also don't want the garbage chute to be a quarter mile from your suite, but somewhere in between, if you get the, if you get the choice, don't be right beside the garbage chute for noise and don't have it be, you know, down three hallways so that you have a hundred meter dash to throw out your trash. Um, and then the elevator bank is the same thing. Most of the time, people push the button, stand there, leave. It's fine. But uh, this just happened to me a few weeks ago. I had people considering a fantastic south-facing, two-bedroom, beautiful unit right across from the three elevator doors. And they had two dogs. We're covering all the bases with these clients. And <laughs> I said, two, two drunk guys are going to come out of somebody's house party because they don't use the party room. And they're going to push <laughs> the button and wait for the elevator and stand there yelling at each other, even though they're three feet apart because they've had too many wobbly pops and your dogs are going to go off. And anyway, it's just, again, it goes back to proximity and noise, right? The elevator right across from your door might seem handy, but maybe you'll just give yourself 20, 30 feet Do between it. you and the elevator door at least, and you'll be in better shape. Way better. And in addition to the garbage thing, because I have experienced that very thing many times in many buildings, so I am mm -hmm. like very specific about where that garbage chute is, is also they stink. Like they just do Oh, good rooms. point. Yeah. yeah. They smell yeah. gross. No matter what they do. Yeah. What? No matter what. I don't care what scent they put in there. It's disgusting. And then also, we have sold many condos like this. I've never experienced it myself, where there's like a beautiful terrace on a lower floor, because sometimes the bigger terraces are on lower floors. And then beneath that is where they have all the garbage bins mm -hmm. underneath that. And then the garbage trucks come and collect, you know, once a week, all the, from the garbage dumpsters. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, in like May, June, July, the wasps on your terrace are going to be like all over the place because they're so drawn to the garbage dumps or dumpsters. So you mm -hmm. want to be very aware of this. And like, don't worry, buyers out there. Like, if you feel like you're being anal asking, like, find out where all these things are and go look at it. Like, the chute, the elevators and the the garbage disposal, the whole process, like figure mm -hmm. it out. And we've had buyers ask us like what day they come pick up the garbage, just find out. You're gonna mm -hmm. be living there, you might as well know. So this really impacts your lifestyle when you're living in a condo community for sure. Yep. The, the other thing I would just add specific to elevators is you also wanna be cognizant of how many elevators there are. So. Yes. For example, when you're riding up to the 120th floor uh, to look at a penthouse or a sub penthouse and you realize there's only like two elevator banks for the entire building, mm -hmm. um, that's a problem. So you, you want to make sure that there's ample elevators because 
um, it's almost written into the status certificates of every condo in Toronto that one permanently has to be broken or <laughs> under repair, yeah. and somebody has to be continuously moving, moving in. in and then yep. disappeared for four hours, and, <laughs> and the concierge can't find them. Yep. So that's two right off the top. Yeah. So you don't want to be in a you know a big tower with only two working elevators, uh, you know where you know 800 yep. people Rush are hour. living. Yep. During during rush hour and and yep. you, you, in that scenario you don't want to forget anything, right? Oh you don't want to leave your keys in the apartment and, and realize that after your 20 minutes sojourn to the lobby. So things to think about for sure. Absolutely. I lived on, on the 40th. Oh, sorry. Go go ahead, Ian. No, I was going to say just to finish that up as well. One of the things that I point out to buyers is if we're in a building for the first time investigating it, push the button. Just how fast does it come? Even if they're all running. Are you standing there for 90 seconds waiting for it or nine seconds, yes. right? So, and in older buildings, they tend to be slower. It just is a rule of thumb. Oh my so, gosh. Yeah. This is why I think it's good. I have lived on like the 40th floor and the 46th floor and I've lived in city place and all over the place in the city. And some of the elevators were so brutal that mm -hmm. I would like, when I was getting ready to go to work in the morning when I used to work a nine to five, whatever that means. Um, I would like go press the elevator button and then go back to my condo and then pack up my, like my bag and everything for the day. Cause I knew it would take 10 minutes for it to come up. Mm. And then it mm -hmm. was the worst when you went down to your car on like P4 and then you're like, shit, you know, I forgot my protein Lunch. powder or whatever. Yeah. I got to go back up. And then <laughs> well, I just was, decided to throw something in there other yeah. than keys. I was trying to be creative, <laughs> but it probably was <laughs> protein powder. And then the other thing. Oh my gosh, we could talk about elevators as a whole topic, I swear. Mm -hmm. When your fire alarm goes off, you know, at 2 a.m., because this happens a lot in condo buildings, and you live mm -hmm. on the 40th floor, and you decide that you're like, maybe it would be probably smart for me not to risk, you know, possibly being in a fire. I am going to go down. You got to like walk down 40 flights of stairs. It's not the most enjoyable thing. Um, but this is why I personally love lower floors in buildings. So, I love living on the third or fourth floor because I can just use the stairs. I can just pop up and down them all the bypass. time. I don't bypass and I don't have to have that weird awkwardness in the elevator with a neighbor and you're kind of talking and you don't really feel like it or whatever it is. Bypass, bypass. And if you have a dog to circle back to the theme of this episode, just scoot up and down the stairs with your, your puppy. It's the best. So good exercise for everybody. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So or I love like the forcing. middle of a pandemic and someone's not wearing a mask and they're like coughing on you in a very enclosed space and it's the yeah. only way you can get up or down. Yeah. yeah. A mm -hmm. lot of reasons. Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, not just the noise of the occupants of the elevator too. One last thing. I promise this will be the last one. But no. don't be beside the elevator machine room either. Right? <laughs> if your unit's right beside the elevator, if that's kind of that's your choice. Have somebody go get it in the elevator and ride it up and down while you actually stand in the unit and see if you yes. can hear the elevator going yeah. back and forth. So that's you another can. one. You Sometimes you can. For sure. Oh There's so many things to think about when you buy a condo and you so don't know many. these. Yeah. You don't know it until you live in one. and then It's you a good thing it. we're here for these people. It's a good oh, thing seriously. we're here. <laughs> it is. Okay. Speaking of other things to consider, uh, your parking spot, mm -hmm. your locker location, um, and are, they, are they accessible? Ralph. Yeah, this this is a big one. Um, you definitely want to make sure that your, uh, you know, Escalade is going to fit <laughs> into mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. <laughs> into the smart car space that the yeah investor the bought box from the developer to yeah. save to save seventy five hundred dollars. I mean, I once rented a condo uh, years ago, and um, I didn't look at the parking spot and my car wouldn't fit in the parking spot. And so I would kind of jump around to different ones because I was friends. This building did have a concierge, so that was <laughs> a benefit. Um, but then eventually I, it caught up to me and, and it became a real, real problem. It was stressful. Um, so you definitely, if you're renting or, you know, more importantly, obviously, if you're buying, uh, you definitely want to make sure that your car fits in the spot. and shockingly there are some parking spots that cars cannot fit in and out of i've seen it before in buildings yeah when there's like were two giant poles yeah yeah we poles. we had a client um and he had a, a bigger size truck and he bought a pre-construction condo and he was assigned 
uh, parking spot that you could just not physically get any car in or out of. So definitely make sure um, your parking spot is usable and usable for the size car that you are driving. Uh, and then, you know, it's a real advantage to be close to the door um, if mm -hmm. you're schlepping things. Convenience. And there's different types of parking spots as well. And so um, is it easy in, to get in and out of? Is it close to the door? Can you carry bags and stuff easily to and from? Uh, are you on P17 and like ringing down <laughs> the bottom and ringing back up versus yeah. P1? P1 being superior. Um, I've done that before so as well. Mm -hmm. So that's important to make sure of. Um, and sometimes we've seen parking spots not even in the same building. Um, sometimes they're in, to an attached condo yep. and you, ha you have to hike for 17 hours. So make sure you check out the parking spot um, and that uh, it's suitable for your needs and that it's a good one um, because it could be a real problem if you drive or rely on your car. And also just knowing if you don't drive, uh, what are rental rates for parking spots? Because in some buildings you're able to capture $300 a month, which is pretty friggin' awesome if you ask me. So um, those are all things to think about uh, with regards to parking. Mm -hmm. And what about storage lockers? Ian. Oh, same thing to a certain degree. Where is it? Is it convenient? Sometimes uh, a good design, a well-designed uh, condo building might have the locker um, in tandem with the parking spot. That's a That's super handy best. thing. That's and some best. some buildings don't necessarily have the lockers uh, downstairs in parking either. Sometimes they're on the second floor. Sometimes they're even as convenient as somewhere else on the same floor as the unit you're purchasing. It's awesome. not as common, but it does happen. Um, so I would say convenience and then also size and lighting and security. So lockers can often kind of have a cage, either wooden or steel. Um, but yeah, what, what do you want to keep in that locker? And um, will it be safe there? Will you feel mm -hmm. confident locking your things in there? Um, the, uh, the other thing I was going to say too is I think uh, bikes are important to a lot of people. So with regard to both the parking spot and the locker, is there a bike room? Um, do you have the option of attaching a bike post to your parking spot? Yes. Um, will your bike fit in your locker for a couple of months if your suite is not very big? All of these are kind of also good things to consider. Yes, and then the last thing I'd like to consider you to consider buyers out there is if you drive an electric vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, some of the newer buildings will have a place for you to do charging, uh, but the older buildings will not. Um, some will, you know, do a like a retrofit for you, but you have to investigate this in advance of mm -hmm. purchasing the condo. Mm -hmm. So as these um auto types become more and more uh, common, you'll definitely want to make sure you have a place to charge your car if you drive such a vehicle. Mm -hmm. All right, good answers. You guys are crushing the auto generator today. All right, well, we kind of went through that. That was concierge and parcel management. All right, this is a good one. Ralph, I'm gonna give this to you because you work a lot on pre-construction. Developer's <sighs> reputation. What did you Stop. just say? <laughs> I felt You're wearing them out. You're wearing them out. I felt, I felt the double whammy coming my way. Um, what was the question again? Develop, the developer's reputation. Yeah, that's really important, uh, especially in newer buildings. Uh, you just really want to make sure that uh, it's built well. Like, I mean, you know, not all buildings are equal um, and not all developers are equal and you really want to make sure that you're in a building and there are notorious buildings uh to people in our circle professionals mm -hmm. uh, professional realtors in our circle uh who know that there are buildings that are stay away from um you know there's a, a builder that went uh, bankrupt uh urban core aka urban crap, urban crap. Yep. and uh you know anything that was built by them uh, you know is probably going to have issues and the status is probably going to have issues and the maintenance fees are probably going to have issues because they're going to be doing a lot of backpedaling um, trying to fix the sloppiness and cheapness of their work. So it's really important um, because when you buy a condo, you're not really just buying a unit, you're buying into the assets and liabilities of a corporation proportional to the square footage of your property. And so 
um, you could end up with a lot of costs and a lot of headaches uh, and a lot of issues and maybe even drama because your condo corp is going to have to be very engaged. Uh, and so mm. it's really important to know that you're getting a building um, that's known to have a good reputation and that's known to have been built by a good developer because um, the valuations generally tend to follow that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great answer. I have a, I right. what I call a blacklist. I tell new buyers mm -hmm. that are looking for condos. I'm like, if you pick a building, I won't just tell you no. I'll tell you all the reasons why. We can still mm -hmm. go look at it if you want to, but uh, the beware list, the blacklist. So Yes. Yeah. And yeah. If, if anyone knows Ian, you don't want to end up on his blacklist. Don't end up yeah. on my on my there's bad a few, list. There's a few yeah. realtors on that list, too, and it hasn't worked out so well for them. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like if you see 15 units for sale in a building, it's probably an indication that it's yep. not a well-run building or the maintenance fees are high or everyone hates living there and there's an issue. That's usually the dead giveaway. You're like, 15 listings in this one building. Hmm. And the prices are really good. Yeah. yeah. For the area. What is going on? Yes. Yeah, $700 exactly. a square foot in downtown Toronto? It's yes. amazing. I yeah. know. Yeah. So we can help you out that, with that, listeners. Um, if you're ever considering a building and you want us to give, us, uh, give you our insider information on that, we generally mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. we, we don't generally know. We do know. All right. So this is a really good follow-up that came from the random generator, actually. It is really worth <laughs> Love that random generator. It's so it random. So, it's so random. It's so good I at know, generating and so random. <laughs> it really is it's doing such a good job. Status certificates, the importance of those. I'm going to toss that to you, Ian. Okay. Uh, the status certificate is, uh, I like to use the term bill of health for a building. Oh, um, nice. It's uh, like a... It's basically, it's a legal document that the building has to be able to provide uh, that outlines uh, how it's doing financially. It will mm -hmm. also include those rules and regulations that I mentioned before. Um, you're buying into, like Ralph just said, uh, the assets and liabilities of a corporation. So essentially what you're asking this building to do for you before you invest in it is to open its books and to kind of be completely transparent and declare everything that's going on. Uh, up to even the perhaps the minutes of the last board meeting so that you've got up to the moment updates on everything that's going on in there. What you'll do with a status certificate is a savvy agent will have that ready for you after you've looked at a unit and shown an interest in it. You will find a real estate lawyer that you can give that to and ask them to review it and share their notes with you. Um, some people like to go through it themselves. Some people find that it's difficult to understand. Our recommendation always is even if you want to read it yourself, you should still get legal counsel to go over it mm -hmm. with you as well. Um, especially someone, you know, a family lawyer is great, but somebody who looks at these things all day, every day, and may already have history with that building is probably your best choice. Um, and some, I'm getting away from the point here a little bit, and some lawyers will give you the straight goods and say, it's this and it's this and it's this and not offer their opinion. I prefer I, I value when a lawyer says it's this and it's this and it's this and adds for people who don't know what they're really looking at I don't see any red flags that are a reason to run away from this or mm -hmm. I see some red flags and I proceed with caution and here's why so for those of us that are not in the legal profession uh, not accountants etc cetera, etc cetera, it's good to have um, someone on your side who can kind of explain these things just like we're doing here we do it yeah. in a real estate way having a lawyer that can kind of break this down into simpler terms for you is very, very helpful. But back to the status certificate. If the agent hasn't ordered one for you um, or hasn't ordered one for their listing in advance, um, they will need to request one. It typically costs between $100 and $200. They can get them on a rush. A rush will still probably be four or five business days. Mm -hmm. Standard is about 10 business days. And um, they will absorb that cost. They will pay for it. They deliver it to you. You take it to your lawyer. This is all good and fine if you're looking at a unit that's been on the market for 30 days and no one else is interested. However, the status certificate can be uh, an item that you need to get reviewed very quickly and come up with a decision about before an offer date when things are moving lickety split. So um, it's a very, very import, uh, important part of the buying process with condos. Mm -hmm. It's almost, it's kind of like the, the, the what am I looking for? I, I'm going to say the, 
the equivalent to a home inspection almost yeah. for like, uh, a freehold property. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most people don't do a home inspection on a condo and you can't obviously do a status certificate review on a freehold property. So yeah. in both totally cases, true. that's your way of checking as much as you possibly can before uh, proceeding with a purchase. Yeah. And the status certificate is going to tell you lots of things too, like are there any anticipated special assessments coming up for the building? Mm -hmm. What are the anticipated increases in maintenance fees? What does the reserve fund look like? All of this stuff is there to protect you as the purchaser well in advance so that you're not blindsided you know, a year or two after acquiring the property and all of these hidden costs are revealed. And it surprises me how many buyers we've worked with in the past on the resale side that have owned condos formally and worked with different agents that had never had seen a status certificate or knew what a status certificate was and had no idea. I'm like, what? This is the most important part of buying a condo is the status certificate in its review. And just as you said, Ian, you've got to work with a real estate lawyer that understands condos and understands downtown Toronto, not your uncle that lives in Sault Ste. Marie. Like they mm -hmm. just, they're going to scare the shit out of you when they read a status certificate. So work with a lawyer that knows downtown, knows the building, sees these things all the time. And they're very also familiar with the blacklist condos too, and know which buildings are problematic for that reason. So I cannot stress how important it is to have this reviewed. And then if there's questions that pop up in the status certificate via your lawyer or your own reading or your agent reading it, you can get more information from property management and it's their job to be able to get you those details. So mm -hmm. if there's anything you're ever unsure about or it's not clear or you need further due diligence, property management should be supplying that information to you and always go in with your eyes wide open particularly mm -hmm. in this area with any condo building in Toronto or anywhere for that matter. Yeah. Ralph, do you want to add anything to status certificates? You look no, very excited right guys, now. I think you guys did a really good job. Oh, thanks. Also, no, I, I do. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. I want to throw thank out you. that the, <laughs> it's it's 90% about the building, maybe even higher than that. And a small amount is actually about your unit specifically as well. So once you know that a building has problems, you can't move to the fourth floor and expect everything to be a ray of sunshine, right? So once you know a building has problems, you pretty much know that you could, should just stay away from that building. Yeah. Right. You can't go back and find a better status certificate the next month with a different unit. Totally. Just to be 100% clear. Totally. Okay. I think I'm going to answer this one. Because okay. I think I put this one into the pot. Okay. This is, I know, my writing's terrible. Please. Development viewers, applications. Oh, nice. That's a good one. Listeners, watchers, may I please introduce Corey Marin, who will now tell us about development applications. It surprises me how many agents don't even know they can look up development applications. So if you're in a condo and you look out at your beautiful view and you're like, wow, oh my gosh, I can see the lake and the CN Tower. <laughs> look at this gorgeous skyline. This is beautiful. And there's this a parking huge, lot. huge sunny terrace. <laughs> yes. And there's a parking lot right beside you. Um... I know this doesn't seem like a stretch here, but there's probably a chance that there's going to be a future development on that site. I know. Shocking. We live in Red a huge flag. city. Red flag. <laughs> and it amazes me every time we list a property with this very setup, agents will call me and be like, do you think there's going to be a building beside there one day? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what do you think? Like, really? Like, if you actually just sit there and think for two seconds, like, do you think the chances of a building going up in an empty parking lot are pretty high? Yes. But do you think you the do... fact that that parking lot has hoarding around it and a giant <laughs> sign no. saying Is development a application? <laughs> the white and, that and there's blue one? Nine buildings for sale for, there's nine units for sale in the building. And On every that exposure? Single, and yeah. every single one of them is west-facing. Like... I know, what, but what I'm think? telling you. So you can go on the City of Toronto website <laughs> and you can go to their development application section and you can see all the pins for all the different things that are going to be developed around your condo building. And it's like, and everyone knows that the development um, process takes forever here. So you get to see things way out in advance and have your eyes wide open once again mm -hmm. uh, about anything that might be popping up in your area. And it's important because, yes, you want to protect your exposure if you can, but also if any of you have lived near a construction site, it, th these buildings don't go up overnight. Like you're going to have to listen to like banging and 
construct uh, dust and construction dust and all the sounds and beeping for like the next four years so living near construction is not enjoyable let alone losing your exposure if that's going to be the case so please check the development applications before you acquire a property or agent should be doing this for you they really should mm -hmm. and if they're a moron and they're not doing it which a lot of agents are morons then please check yourself and go on the city of toronto website you can see so much information there building heights um how many stories it's going to be obviously if it's going to be residential commercial mixed use all of that information is there you can often even see the renderings of the buildings that are going up so you mm -hmm. can get a sense of all of that so i feel like this is a big time a big time piece and i think a lot of agents skip this part of their due diligence mm -hmm. yeah and it's this isn't necessarily just for condos uh if you're looking at buying a house it could be forest hill or rosedale it doesn't matter if you're close to a main thoroughfare or you know Eglinton is one or two streets over, or Avenue Road is. You should look to see if there's anything coming down those thoroughfares because it can equally and sometimes even more so have an effect on a house or a neighborhood uh, than a condo. So always keep your eyes open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one hundred percent. And sometimes the, these buildings can add value to your area too and not are not always a negative thing you just want to no. know before you close on your property or purchase the property you don't want to you don't want to pay a premium for an exposure that you're going to lose yes mm -hmm. yes definitely okay guys we're almost through the box great wow. job guys great job <laughs> okay well I, I feel like this is kind of obvious because we and but i'll just toss it out there so building location Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Anyone confused by that? <laughs> We've already talked about location, 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 proximity to transit, green space. Yeah. Is there anything that we've left off that list that should still be covered? Shopping, restaurants, bars, walkability score, check, check, um, check. schools, all of that. The other thing just I'll throw out there is there's different types of ways to look at location. There's premium locations in established neighborhoods. There's also up and coming locations mm -hmm. yeah so sometimes you know you can be looking at a location and be like okay it's a little dodgy but in a couple of years from now because of x y and z it won't be and so you have an opportunity from an investment standpoint um, to pay at a lower price or premium or not pay a premium and they'd be able to take advantage of the upside as the mm -hmm. area and location uh, continues to uh, gentrify Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Are there any locations in the city that you would encourage your buyers not to look at? Hmm. Yes. Would you like to share? Um, Fort York. Not a fan. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would. Uh, Fort York is the first one. That's like pretty much a no fly zone uh, for me and for a lot of our clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to toss in. Liberty Village. Mm -hmm. Not all of Liberty Village, but some of Liberty Village. It is just some of those buildings are shit, like really shit buildings in Liberty it's, Village. It's a difference as well for rent versus buy. Mm -hmm. If you're renting, you know, that's one thing. But if you're looking at spending six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred, a million dollars. Um, you really want to be smart and strategic with, with where you're locating yourselves and, and where you're writing that check to live and to own in. And there's definitely buildings in, you know, a Liberty Village pocket or a Fort York to stay away from. And, and you know, it's what we were saying earlier. Don't get lured into the, the, the lower price points. Think long term and, and understand what the opportunity is with each and every opportunity that you're evaluating mm -hmm. absolutely and, and the, would you all, add any um there's a couple that come to mind but before i forget just like you said about uh, not using your uncle lawyer from sault saint marie if you are <laughs> yes. looking for a condo in toronto but you're coming from some somewhere in the surrounding area it doesn't matter where um don't use your agent from there um right you, use someone who's used to all of these buildings who no, has uh, you know, the, a, a list of damaged buildings, bad areas, somebody who knows what's going on here. The example I always use is that someone once asked me to help them buy a place in Muskoka, a close friend. And I said, oh, yeah. no, 
no, yeah. like I just don't know enough, I wouldn't be protecting you. It wouldn't be serving your best interests to use me. So let's find you somebody who does. Just like I would never use a Muskoka agent to come downtown and, and buy a condo, right? Totally. Find somebody who knows the area, knows the market, knows the buildings. So 100%. Yeah. I would never, I wouldn't even know how to do a deal on a cottage with like lakefront. I wouldn't, no idea. No, exactly. Septic systems and you crown you land. Yeah. Water, <laughs> do, right? water erosion. Like yeah. all the things that the locals are talking about. And I then, hey, no someone idea. from the city just bought that house that's been on the market for three years. Yeah, for twice as much as it was listed for because somehow they got conned into thinking it was a bidding war. Yeah. I know, I have yeah. no idea. And are there any locations that you would um, consider to be on the ban list for buyers, Ian? Uh, um, it's a great question. I think um, I, I no immediate area comes to mind right now. I'm because I'm also thinking about like where are they putting new developments where I'm not a fan. Um, and I want to go back to, I think, the developer reputation and the gentrification comments mm -hmm. that Ralph was saying. Sometimes it's tough to tell. It's tough to tell. Um, but I think, I think where the LRT is going is going to be really interesting to see what comes up in the way of uh, condo, new condo buildings as that yeah. kind of takes hold. And where will gentrify, what, what areas along the LRT will, will gentrify quickly versus the ones that are still a little behind and might still take 20 to 30 years to, to kind of come online as, as being nice or even nice enough. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with that one. And then the other one I just want to add, I'm not a super fan of the Lakeshore Park Lawn Pocket. Not, some of the buildings are great, but not yeah. all of them. That's like yeah. my other one. I don't love. Some, some, some aren't bad. It really no, some aren't bad. Yeah. I'm just saying like this is, these are areas where I feel like there's like standout buildings that I would avoid. And I Fort York yes. has them. Liberty Village for sure yeah. has them. And I also feel like that pocket um, also has some where I'm just like, there is no way that mm -hmm. I would permit. I would be like embarrassed to uh, you be know the what? buyer in, agent. In all three of those areas, I find, I think that it's the earlier buildings, like the totally. first ones, the first ones that went up in all three of those, you know, big areas. I think generally those are the ones with the biggest problems. Yep. Totally. And along those lines, too, when you're in a building, a lot of people aren't paying attention until they get to the suite. That is the part that they're worried about. Look yeah. at the finishes in the hallways. Is this oh, building yeah. three years old? Is it beat to shit already? Right? <laughs> yes. Does it look like garbage in that hallway that's three years old? Does it, you know, in, in the lobby, right? What kind of shape is it in? Is there garbage in the hallway? Go yeah. to the stairwell, right? How, what's the shape of the interior of the elevator? How well are people treating this? Which also leads me to what percentage of people in that building are renters versus owners, right? Yep. Which is another thing we haven't talked about. Are you moving into a rental party building? Totally. And that's actually in the random generator oh. um, because I had a sneak I'm jumping peek, ahead. But no, let's talk about it because it's a huge one. Yeah. So when you have your status certificate reviewed, there should be a disclosure as to how many uh, units are rented versus how many are end user occupied. It's not always 100% accurate, but you're going to want to know what that is because the more renters there are, generally speaking, the more of a party building it is. And then also, does the building permit Airbnb or short term rental? And we're seeing more and more that most buildings are not permitting short term rental for mm -hmm. this reason. So, protecting the integrity of the building. And so you want to see that they usually are not permitting. It's best in your best interest as an end user that they do not permit it. Um, and that leases need to be 12 months or longer. So an extended lease. This will protect the building's value. And then you'll also avoid all those things like beer bottles in the elevator, puke in the stereo, <laughs> all the things that go <laughs> along with a building that can often feel more like a hostel than you know yes. a boutique building in the city. So this is a big thing to consider when looking at a building and I find so what happens is buildings kind of calm down so when they first get construction constructed and registered they'll be and most of the time a lot of investors have purchased these units they will go out and rent them out right away so for the first year first year to three years there's a lot of rentals in the building until there's that first turnover and once that first turnover starts happening and investors are now getting their ROI on their property and an end user comes to acquire, then there's a settling of the building. It starts to flip from being 
more renter centric to more end user centric and that's like a nice sweet spot to be in a building the maintenance fees have not gone up too much and the building's in still really good condition and so that's kind of like a nice time to be looking at a residential resale condo in that exact time period mm -hmm. if you're wanting to avoid those big towers that are party party yep we call that the goldilocks zone it's not yes. too hot, hot not too cold not it's too just cold. right exactly it's funny yeah. one of the things we don't get these calls really anymore but there was a time where people were like yeah i want to i want a condo and i want to get a couple of them and i want to airbnb in the airbnb them out and i'm like listen man you don't want to own a condo in a building that will allow you to airbnb it and they're like why and i'm like well your cash flow might be okay you're going to pay taxes on your profit but you know your net is not going to be as great as you think it's going to be but even more importantly than that, the value of your unit is going to go way down significantly when it comes time to sell mm -hmm. because people don't want to pay a premium to live in an Airbnb building. And so we, I mean, these conversations we used to have ad nauseum is going back probably mm -hmm. pre-COVID, I would think, somewhere in around there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, these conversations are fewer and far in between. And, um, you know, like even recently we had a client and, and she was like, I'm in the city half the year probably and not the other half. And can I Airbnb it out the other half? And, you know, I'm like, do you want to be in a nice building that's going to retain its value and appreciate? And she's like, yeah. And we're like, well, it's, it's not going to happen for you. Yeah. So get Airbnb out of your head yes. um, and look for a really good property that uh, is in a great location and has all of the uh, properties uh, that we've discussed today. Yep. It's and live in it yourself great. or find a full-time tenant. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Sorry, Corey. I didn't Corey. think we had anything to say about building location. Okay. There's not very many topics left. Oh my, well, actually, there's quite a few, so let's hustle through. All right. Speed round. Yeah. Oh, speak. Oh, yeah. Speed round. You want to do a speed round? Speed yeah. round. Okay. So... Ian, I know you're really good at doing this. Speak to existing residents while you're looking at the property. Yes. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. When you are in the hallway, in the elevator with some time to kill, if you spot somebody, I'll do this all the time. Jump in the elevator. Somebody else gets in. You say, hey, nice weather we're having. And strike up a conversation. Ask if they're an end user. Ask if they're a renter. Ask them how they like the building. Ask them if they have any significant complaints. I've learned a lot of important things that are not in a status certificate from somebody in an elevator with the client standing right there listening. Do it. Hot tip. Hot tip. Listeners. And I, I'm just going to add one other thing. There is such a thing as friendly buildings. There are certain buildings where people yes. seem really friendly. I have no idea why. Maybe it's the Park 120 Bayview. Like the friendliest buildings yes. in the city. Everyone stops. There's lots of dogs, dogs of all sizes. People are happy. They're talking. Such a happy, 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 happy building. And so mm -hmm. there are Wish happy buildings there, and there are <laughs> sour buildings and there are retirement homes. So, you know, it's really good to understand which vibe is, is your vibe. What's happening? Um, because yeah. every building really does have its own personality. Mm -hmm. So true. All right. I like that you guys just whipped that in shape for me. This is a good one from the random generator to top that off. What about, uh, Ralph, building, does the building's age matter, speaking of Ye retirement homes? Yes, it does. Um, the first thing to consider is um, new buildings are covered under Terry on warranty. Um, and it depends on what the um, in item is, but I think it's something like plumbing is three years, electrical is two years, structural is seven years. So having all of that covered by insurance super helpful because it holds the developer accountable if there's any issues that come up. So people aren't necessarily aware that they have those protections under Terion. And as a building over time becomes older, like we talked about, those maintenance fees start to creep up and costs start to creep up and it does affect values. And at some point, the rate of appreciation will start to slow down significantly. And from an investment standpoint, anyways, it's that sweet spot of a time that um, you may want to consider selling and moving on to something else. I would just like to add, though, that older buildings are better built. And so yes. if you some. can find some, 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 some yeah. not all, but there are some older buildings where the, ma the property management company has done a very good job keeping the maintenance fees in check. True. 
and you can get a nice, beautiful suite where they have constructed them very well. And mm -hmm. they're re great soundproofing, not too many floors, lots of elevators, great services. Yeah. So I don't think that our listeners out there should knock them. I think it no. really does at all. And I yeah. think that oh. they can sometimes be, if you can renovate an older unit that has good maintenance fees, you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck. Yeah. Adult size I, rooms, I, I, adult size yes. appliances. Yeah. Adult size. Right? Some of them, size. like I, I love the summit at King and Bathurst. You have working fireplaces in some of the suites in there. Exactly. Like, you just yeah. you can't find that today. Not at yeah. all. Okay. Well, speaking of well-managed buildings, does property management matter, Ian? Oh yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. So there are some really good professional property management companies, and um, those companies. When we see those on a listing as the property management company, it makes us all sort of breathe a sigh of relief. It's like, okay, the status certificate for this is probably going to be pretty good. Uh, the building's probably in good shape, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a guarantee, but it's kind of our first indicator. If it's if it's a good company, it's going to be well run. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, totally. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to push back on you and say that it can it, the companies mean less the the actual property manager means more and i'll give the analogy of the bank it doesn't matter if you're at cibc or right. bank of montreal or point. rbc it's who your bank manager is and you can be at oh i love cibc they're amazing i've got the best bank that bank manager leaves and you've got a bad bank manager cibc then sucks and so i really think who the property manager is matters more than the company. There is some correlation where some companies have more or better property management uh, managers on the whole, mm -hmm. but it's really the relationship with the property managers. And there are some, they get back to you right away. They answer all your questions. They're so polite. They're there to serve the owners of the building and they really take their job and professionalism to the next level. And then there's others that's that just not so much, like, like you can't even get an answer out of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, how are you best serving the owners of this building? Yeah. And so it, I, it's, it's the actual manager for me and the relationship with that manager. And if you have a good relationship with a manager in a building, it's amazing how your entire experience and your client's experience, can totally be different from the exact same building that could be next door, even the same condo corp or the same development or same developer, and it's totally different. And we've seen this happen time and time again. This is a good question to ask the residents in the building when you're in the elevator. Like, how's property management here? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. they will give you the quick oh, yeah. insider on that very yep. question. Because that's a difficult thing to figure out when you're looking blind at a building. So I think Excellent that's point. a good tip. Yep. yep. Okay, let's see, this is the last one. Oh, we answered it already, guys. This is about okay. short-term rental and Airbnb, which we've already answered. So, in summary, is there anything we didn't cover today? I thought we gave some great tips to our listeners and viewers out there. Ian, you wanna jump in? I just wanted to jump in, and I, I thought of it earlier, I just took a note because I wanted to come back around. Yeah. Um, because we talked about amenities and how they add up and how they can push a maintenance fee up. We talked about status certificate and what's in there. Um, I think there might be some people watching this who say, well, what about, you know, a, a building that was, um, that basically has no amenities, no concierge, but there's still mm -hmm. a four or $500 maintenance fee. You know, there's, there's 80 units in this smaller building. There's nobody at the front door. There's no pool. There's no gym. There's no anything, just a security system. But my maintenance fee is four or $500 a month. What does that cover? So I think, I think we should kind of talk a little bit about um, what's going into the reserve fund and why. And mm -hmm. the fact that there are still expenses, even though you're not seeing them, like who's cleaning those hallways once a week? Who's cleaning the interior of the elevator, right? Um, does anybody want to take that one on and sort of break down how a maintenance yeah, fee sure. works when you can't really visually see where that money's going? Yeah, like I think the first thing for people to understand um, who may not be aware of this is, is that uh, you don't really own as much as you think you own when you own a condo. So anything from the walls out, meaning your balcony, meaning the glass, meaning uh, the hallway, meaning your door. Uh, there are just so many, the, the, the plumbing that runs above it, the plumbing that runs below it. Um, there's just so many items uh, and so many aspects to a condo that you don't own that do require maintenance. 
um, that need to be paid for, um, you know, parking lots, you know, underground parking have mm -hmm. foundation issues eventually over time. Cracks will appear over time. Uh, mm -hmm. Drywall, you know, will will get holes in them or, you know, scuffed up or, mm -hmm. you know, roofs need to be replaced. Um, you know, you got to have um, landscaping out front. There's security snow and removal. cost to security, snow removal, insurance. That's a big one. I, mm -hmm. I've, I can't tell you how many status certificates I've seen where there's a slip and fall lawsuit. You know, mm -hmm. every I think every condo in the city now they has love one. slip and fall. Yeah, <laughs> slip and falls. Some of them are usually like under a million. Um, I'm like, oh, it's just a slip and fall. It's fine. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Insurance, insurance will cover it. It'll settle out of court and insurance will pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> Your maintenance fees will go up 50 bucks. Um, yeah. But like it's, it, there, there's a lot to owning a property that when you actually start to think about it outside of your condo, um, it starts to become expensive. And, you know, it's not a bad exercise to one day review your status certificate and take a look mm -hmm. and look at the budget and actually do the thing that nobody does or very few people do and actually go to a condo court meeting or get involved or vote and you'll see how onerous it is. I mean, I've never been uh, on a condo court, but you talk to I people. Did. Yeah, it, it's anybody that I know that has done it has told me not to do it because what they thought would be kind of fun and interesting ends up being extremely time consuming, stressful and 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 um, not necessarily a pleasant experience and very thankless as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I, and I think this actually is a really good question that you brought up, Ian. And I think you'll see that oftentimes in like a loft conversion building. So, you know, an old factory that's been converted into a beautiful mm -hmm. like 70 suites and they might not even have underground parking. They might have sur uh, surface parking because obviously they're not going to build underground parking under a beautiful old factory. They can't. And so yeah. they can't. Um, so you'll often see a little bit of higher fees in these like premium character buildings and they don't have a lot of amenities because the cost to run those buildings and to heat and cool them and run the mechanicals and keep them up to date, you know, even the masonry work and all those things, that has to be all looked after and that's what brings up the fees. But you're right, it is sort of a question. People are like, I don't get it. Why am I paying all these fees for Who's nothing? getting my $500? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a really good point. Anything else you want to add to this topic? This is such, these are such important things to consider when buying a condo. And I feel like a lot of buyers and their agents overlook all of these things, which really are the meat and potatoes of, of condo life, which can be really awesome. I personally have loved living in condos over the years. Not all of the buildings I've lived in, but many of them, because it truly is maintenance free. Like it's like living in a hotel. Ralph, I, I, I've always loved it. Ralph touched on a thing. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, he was saying, you know, what you own and what you don't own. I think it's very important. We touched on how the, the pet restrictions are in the rules and regulations. But everyone, even if you don't touch the status certificate for any other reason, should go over those in detail to find out, can I have a barbecue on this terrace? Mm -hmm. Right? If I'm in a townhouse, can I put some patio furniture outside the door? Or is that common elements where I'm not allowed to do that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, every other rule and regulation about bikes, um, hours of operation hours. of the gym. Yeah. Exactly. So I think, you know, even if you don't do the numbers, if you leave a lot of this up to the lawyer, make sure that you go through that because again, to beat a, beat this over and over again, you want to go in eyes wide open. You don't yeah. want a rude awakening after spending hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars on this investment. Does I think, it, um, I think the uh, one real way to sort of sum this up is you could have three condos side by side. They could be all built by the same developer or built by different developers all at the same time or over time. And what you'll see is each one will be very different from the other in terms of how they're run, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the rules and regulations, in terms of the reserve funds, in terms of maintenance fees, in terms of appreciation in terms of values, in terms of everything. So don't make assumptions because you were in one condo and had an experience or saw what it sold for or looked at that status certificate, that the same is gonna apply for the one next door to it or the one down the block because every building is its own personality, is its mm -hmm. own um, economic ecosystem and is its own environment. And you should really respect that 
And the more you respect that, I think the better your outcome will be uh, if you're looking to purchase something. That's great. Yep. And also for our listeners out there, we're gonna do another episode soon on suite selection specifically. So how to buy a great floor plan, uh, whether it's residential, resale, or pre-construction. And we have a lot of great ideas and insights on that. So be sure to tune back in for that episode because that's where we're gonna get into the juxtaposition of, you know, all of the things floor plan related and all of those details and a lot of those things people overlook as well if they've never lived in a condo. So I am so grateful that you both participated in the random generator today. I think that we tossed out some great ideas for our viewers. Uh, of course, if you have questions or comments, please pop them in um, below for us and we're happy to respond anytime. Uh, anything to say on, on our way out the door today, boys? No. No, I think that was great. Okay. I, I think we should do another random generator episode sometime soon, too. That was a okay, lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Ralph, want to take us Smash away? Smash that like button down below. Subscribe, comment, give us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And just smash that red thing right below, right there. <laughs> Thanks for Ciao. watching.